let's say that no one has looked at Alzheimer's or neurodegenerative disease. What do we need to know? I mean, the first thing I think everybody needs to know, um, you're talking about from a personal risk standpoint or just understanding the disease? Personal risk. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing I, I you know, we want to know from all of our patients is tell us your family history, right? The, you know, there is a genetic component to this disease. So let's understand what your susceptibility is. Um, Would you ask them that ahead of just saying, go and get a, a genetic test done? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because the, the, I think the family history is more telling than the genetic test. Wow. Okay. Because yeah. remember, the genetic test we look at, is we look at the most common gene, which is the gene that's easiest to test for, which is ApoE. There are a dozen other genes that we look at, but they're much harder to sift for. There aren't really great commercial tests for them. And so, God knows if there's something lurking that isn't part of this current paradigm of what we understand. It's basically, yeah, exactly. did it show up? Yeah. If it showed up. Yeah. So right. so right out of the gate, we want to know, is, is, um, is dementia in your family? If so, what type do we think it is? So do we think it's Alzheimer's dementia? Do we think it's vascular dementia? Do we think it's frontotemporal lobe dementia? Do we think it's Lewy body dementia? Is there Parkinson's disease? When you think about just comparing Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Those are three types of neurodegenerative diseases that are on a spectrum where Alzheimer's is the, is the most cognitively destructive. Parkinson's is the most movement, movement destructive. Lewy body is taking bits of both of their playbook, right? So Lewy body is destructive to both movement and cognition. Well, we want to understand exactly what pattern you may or may not be a part of. We also want to understand age of onset. So, um, tragically there, there's a, Fortunately, very, very rare, but um, you know, still unfortunately um, prevalent form of early onset Alzheimer's disease. These are people who are afflicted in their forties and fifties. Is that what Chris Hemsworth got? No, no. He got uh, he realized something during that. Yeah, Chris. Chris right? learned that he has two copies of the ApoE4 gene, and the ApoE4 gene is the most common genetic. Uh, you know, the most common gene responsible for Alzheimer's disease, but not, but it's not early. It's not early onset, right? Okay. It's a late onset predisposition. Okay. The early onset ones are, um, called APP, PSEN1, PSEN2. Um, so again, those can be tested for, we don't normally test for those because it's normally so apparent from family history. Uh, of course. Now, yes. if we document that, we would of course test for, it. uh, tragically, I think that's a variant of Alzheimer's disease that is, um, I think it's less clear how much you can prevent lifestyle independent, basically. right? Whereas the one that Chris has and that 25% of the population has, if they have one copy of that gene, that's highly amenable to prevention, which really gets to why we want to know this stuff. Um, you want to know this stuff because one, sometimes that's the motivation people need to take this seriously when they're 35 years old and young and indestructible, because that's the time you want to actually act. Uh, and secondly, there are certain things that we know are even more important to people with that genotype. So it would factor into what medications we might use to lower cholesterol. It might factor into how much omega-3 EPA and DHA we would want them to take. It might factor into other choices we might make around nutrition. And even in people who are exercise time limited, it might factor into how we prescribe exercise. What are the biggest prophylactics against mental de degradation over time? So I did, recently did a podcast on this. Um, it's an AMA on my podcast that is 100% devoted to all interventions that improve cognition and delay the onset of dementia. And I sort of broke it down into here are the things for which there is no ambiguity about the benefit. So enormous signal. I'm not going to talk much about them because it's I'll, I'll give you you know the basics on it. And then I spent the entire podcast talking about the gray stuff where there's probably a benefit, but it's harder to quantify. So you're asking what are those things that I didn't really talk about? It's basically exercise. Um. Uh, lipid management, not having type two diabetes, and probably sleep, having adequate sleep. Those are those are the no regret moves that that have enormous impact, uh, and it's probably in that order. So it seems like looking at what we've spoken about so far today, and you mentioned it earlier on. You thought um, diet was this unbelievably huge lever. It seems now that exercise is one of the longest, if not maybe the longest. I think it is. 
that you're talking about? I think it is, yeah. I think the da- certainly the data would suggest that, right? So in other words, you go back to – so a hazard ratio is a very uh, – it's an important tool in statistics to understand the relative risk or benefit of any intervention. So a hazard ratio of one means that this intervention has no benefit and no harm. A hazard ratio of 1.5 means this intervention is 50% riskier than the baseline. A hazard ratio of 0.75 means this intervention is 25% less risky, right? Okay. So um, when you just go off those numbers, what's the, what's the hazard ratio of smoking? Well, it depends on the study, but it's about 1.4. So what that means is, and that's for all cause mortality. So that means that if you're a, if you compare a smoker to a non-smoker, all things equal, at any point in time, that smoker is forty percent more likely to die in a given year than the non-smoker. It's devastating, right? If you look at hypertension, it's about one point two, one point two one. So having high blood pressure means you're about twenty to twenty one percent more likely to die in a given year than someone who's identical to you in every way except they don't have high blood pressure. If you look at somebody with, you know, atherosclerosis, so advanced cardiovascular disease, it's about 1.25. Um, if you look at somebody with end stage kidney disease, so someone who's on dialysis, it's like 2.75. That means they're 175 percent more likely to die in a given year than someone who's not in end stage renal disease. So. Now start comparing all of these other interventions I'm talking about. Well, let's go back to the VO2 max. If you take somebody who's in the bottom 25% of fitness, which by definition, 25% of the population are, and you compare them to somebody who's in the top 2% for their age, it's a five, the hazard ratio is five. So that means it's 400% difference in mortality. If I take somebody who is in the bottom quartile of strength and compare them to the top quartile of strength, it's about three as a hazard ratio. So when you go through these metrics of exercising or muscle mass or strength or cardiorespiratory fitness, it just dwarfs everything else, including diabetes, including smoking. So, and again, this isn't a zero sum game. Like the goal is get as many things on your side as possible. Be of normal weight. Don't have diabetes. Be sleeping well. Don't smoke. But be strong as hell. Have a high VO2 max. I mean, you want you want to stack the odds as much in your favor as possible. There's no guarantee in life. And this there's still an enormous stochastic random bad luck component to life. I could walk out of here and get hit by a car. Um, but I'd like to control what I can control. Heart disease is the biggest killer on the planet at the moment? Bar none. Why are our hearts so fragile? I mean, actually, I would argue they're not, right? If you consider what your heart is doing, right? You know, it's like this amazing organ that is beating nonstop without any instruction from you consciously um, and has this remarkable capacity to respond to your autonomic nervous system on demand, right? Someone runs through this door and startles us. Our heart rates are going to skyrocket instantly. We don't even need to tell it something bad is happening, right? I, you know, you, you go to, you know, get stem cells at elevation, your heart rate knows to get jacked. Uh, so, 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 so this, this thing is in a remarkable muscle, um, but it has, um, it has a narrow blood supply, you know? So, um, and it doesn't have a remarkable capacity to revascularize itself. That's probably its biggest drawback. You know, other muscles in our body uh, have a much easier time undergoing angiogenesis. So if, you know, if you suffered kind of, um, you know, an occlusion of a, of a blood vessel, a small blood vessel in, in your leg, it wouldn't cause as much trouble uh, because you'd have kind of an easier time creating collateral flow around it. But in the heart, that's 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 less the case. And of course, the stakes are much higher. You probably wouldn't notice it if a, you know, a silver dollar sized patch of your quad stopped working. It wouldn't wreak as much havoc as if an equal size patch of your left ventricle stopped working. Um, so the problem is that 
evolution didn't really care about atherosclerosis. That's, that's really the problem, right? So atherosclerosis is driven by factors that evolution wasn't at all caring about because they didn't interfere with reproductive fitness. So smoking, high blood pressure, and high ApoB are the main drivers of atherosclerosis, and none of those things were on evolution's radar. In fact, you could argue um, high ApoB for a period of our human history would have been beneficial. ApoB being the lipoprotein that wraps around LDL and VLDL would have played an important role in a scarce nutrient environment, which we were in up until a few hundred years ago. And today, of course, it creates a problem, right? Today, those ApoB particles, those LDL particles are carrying cholesterol into our artery walls and our immune system, which by the way, is doing the best job it can, like the little train that could, is treating that as though it's a foreign invader and mounting an enormous immune response. And it's that immune response that's actually leading to the creation of plaque that ultimately results in a heart attack. So when it comes to heart disease, it seems like there's two broad elements here. One would be restricting the things which cause risk, and the other would be improving yourself from baseline. What are the uh, big buckets in either of those? You've mentioned smoking. Smoking, blood pressure, and ApoB. So if you just took those three things off the table, I, it's, it's very hard to imagine how you can get atherosclerosis. So if you don't smoke, if you maintain a blood pressure at or below 120 over 80, and if your ApoB is maintained at the physiologic level that kids have, you can't get atherosclerosis. How does someone know about their ApoB? Simple blood test. Cost about 12 bucks. Okay. And how often do you need to get that done? Uh, I mean, I probably check mine three or four times a year. I probably check mine three times a year. Um, yeah. And if it came back and said, this is high, then you would try to ask the question, why is it high? How much of this is going to be fixable by diet? How much of this is going to be fixable pharmacologically? Truthfully, to get to the levels that are necessary to eradicate atherosclerosis for most people does require pharmacologic intervention. This is probably, in, in my opinion, if antibiotics represent the biggest win of medicine 2.0, uh, anti-lipid therapy would be the second biggest win. Okay. That's stopping the bad. Yep. Improving the good for the heart. Yeah. So again, exercise, not surprising. Yep. Um, and it's, it's probably more so the benefit on cardio here, you probably are going to see more of a, the data would certainly suggest that cardio is the more important exercise of the two. But again, I always caution people, you're not just feeding your heart, you got to worry about your brain, you got to worry about your body. So we're never going to get into the to a cardio or strength paradigm. It's and it's always going to be and but just to be clear, the cardio training probably has a better impact on the heart. Um, sleep. So uh, lo, you know, poor sleep has devastating impact on the heart, probably through sympathetic overtone, uh, hypercortisolemia, things like that. So stress becomes another thing that really matters. It's kind of, it's, again, it's one of these sort of fuzzy terms that kind of seems like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah stress, I'm sure. But, but I, I think the data are very clear that high levels of cortisol, um, are, are really damaging to coronary arteries. Um, and then again, nutrition kind of factors in probably to the pharmacologic strategy. So there's no question that um, for, you know, if you're, if you were saying, what would be the most draconian nutrition step I could take to minimize my lipids? Um, I, you could take that step, but you're probably creating three other problems in its wake. Mm. Right. So if you went on like a 10% fat diet, you would probably drop your lipid levels to, you know, very healthy levels. The problem is what other problems would you create? How do your hormones look? Yeah. How do your hormones look? How does your muscle mass, all these other things. And so- What's your quality of life like? Only having 10% fat in your diet. Right. So the way I think about it is when I can use, so, so if I can use pharmacology to solve a problem without creating another problem, that's a far better use case than- using nutrition to solve a problem that creates a whole bunch of other problems. Because you can be more targeted. Yeah. Yep. Understood. That's interesting. What's happening, people? If you enjoyed that, then press here for the full unedited episode. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.